God's people said amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 17. Joshua chapter 17. And we've been preaching through the book of Joshua. We come to two really interesting verses. Only two. So you're probably thinking our pastor is not going to preach very long because there's only two verses. Turn to your neighbor and say, think again. You just go right ahead and tell them, think again. No, seriously, I, I, I don't want to take much time today. We've already worshipped, but Joshua 17 and verse 12. Yet the people of Manasseh, now that's one of the 12 tribes of Israel, the people of Manasseh could not take possession of those cities. But the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. Now when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not utterly drive them out. They did not drive them out. So let me tell you a story. We've been preaching through this great book, and it is about the settling of the promised land. God had released his people out of Egyptian bondage. They had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Now they've come to the edge of the Jordan and they are getting ready to cross over into what we now know as modern day Israel. They are ready to accomplish and, and conquer the land. God had promised it to them generations before and now they're ready to actually take the land. And the Bible tells us in the book of Joshua about this process. In fact, if you start back in chapter 10, 12, 13, it starts to get boring. Not that the Bible's boring, but it talks about, well, this tribe went in and they took this part of the land. And this tribe went in and took this part of the land. And, and uh, so I'm not going to preach. It, it's like preaching a genealogy. You know, that's really difficult to do. But then all of a sudden, they begin to conquer the land. They take Jericho. They take some of the major cities. And then they begin to divide the land up between the, the really the 11 tribes. The Levites didn't get any land because they were the priestly tribe. They were going to live in Jerusalem. But the Bible tells us that when they begin to drive out the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Termites and every other ite you could think of, the Bible is very clear. God told his people, drive them all out. Every one of them. Every single one of them. And then we come to Joshua 17, 12 and 13. Manasseh, which is one of the larger of the tribes, tells us that they could not drive out one of the clans of the Canaanites. And the Bible tells us that instead of persisting at driving this ungodly pagan clan out of this area, they let them stay. In fact, the Bible tells us here in verse 12 and 13, they, they put them to forced labor. They enslaved them, but that's not what God wanted. God wanted them to drive every one of them out. Now, now this would become the, the Achilles heel of the people of God. They, they would have to live with this decision for the rest of their life. Because they disobeyed God and they did not drive them all out. Guess who was constantly there? Even though, even though Manasseh ruled the area and even though Israel ruled all of the nation, they were constantly dealing with with this infestation of paganism that they never drove out. This reminds me of, of, of the farmer that I used to work for. It had a big old milk barn, and when you went in the building at night, you turned the lights onto the barn, and mice would just go everywhere. So you know what he did? He got a couple of cats. And those cats ate all they could. They were big cats. And then they couldn't move and they couldn't eat any more mice. So you had the infestation. Isn't that gross? It is. 
Now, you might be thinking, now, Kevin, Pastor, you, th- what does this have to do with anything about my life in 2017? This was written over a couple of thousand years ago. You're telling us about the conquering of the promised land. And what's the big deal about Manasseh not being able to drive out this little tribe? Well, there's a very important principle here that's true throughout all the Scripture. That when God comes into our life, and He wants to rule and reign in us, and He wants to rule and reign in every section of our life, here is His command. I want you to drive out every false notion of a God. I want you to drive out everything that would stand against me. It it is called the removal of idolatry. It's the first four commandments. Thou shalt not have no other God before our God. And so the command has always been true. It may not be literal people, but when God wants to come and rule and reign in our lives, guess what He wants us to do? He wants us to drive everything out. And when we don't, guess what? We have to constantly deal with the things that remain in our life. Let me give you a statement. Just think about this. We live with the failure to drive out sin because we would prefer to live in disobedient peace. Can I say, let me put it another way. We prefer many times to avoid a war with sin because we would prefer to not have to be persistent in driving things out. Now, this is true for the unbeliever, certainly. If the Lord Jesus is not enthroned on, the heart of, on your heart, if the Lord Jesus doesn't have control of your head, if the Lord Jesus is not your Lord, then you have already succumbed to the paganism of the culture. And even if we are Christians, how often do we continue to deal with things in our life even after we come to Christ and we never, we we just continually refuse to deal with those things. We excuse those things. We we push them away. We, We don't want to deal with the sins and the attitudes and the behaviors, the swirling emotions of the heart, the wrong thinking of the head. And all of a sudden we find ourselves in love with Jesus and in love with the world at the same time and there's a tug of war going on and nobody wins in that. Now let me give you three things to think about and some practical advice right here based on this text. The number one thing that I want you to notice is that God's command to drive things out that oppose him is still true. It is still true. God wants to drive out people, places, ideas, and things, or to rearrange our relationship with them that take precedent over him. You see, the greatest sin, ladies and gentlemen, is not drunkenness, it's not pornography, it's not homosexuality, it's not being mean to your wife, it's not being a bad kid. The greatest sin recorded in Scripture is idolatry. To replace God with anything, yea, anything that would take His place. So let me ask you the question this morning, what what has enthroned itself in your life that needs to be driven out? Who or what is your God? And God's command to drive it out is true. Here's the second thing. Whatever God asks us to drive out, guess what? It's stubborn. Anybody stubborn in here? Not just we, but the sins that God wants us to drive out are persistent. In fact, the Bible tells us in Joshua 17.10, you know what it says about the Canaanites? 
It says they had chariots of iron and they were a strong people. This wasn't going to be easy. Man, they went in there and if they thought this was going to be a cakewalk, it wasn't going to be. And so here's the, not only is the command true, but brothers and sisters, this is true for us. When we come to faith in Christ, when we surrender our life to Him, the war is enjoined. The war, in a sense, begins. The victory's been won, but the war continues because guess what? When Jesus Christ comes and enthrones Himself in your life and in my life, guess what? It just now begins, and the sins that so easily beset us, the sins that will cause us to stumble, don't go easy, do they? In fact, let me give you this scenario. Here's the way it works. A person comes to faith in Christ. They're brand new. You remember that? You remember when you were brand new in Christ? I mean, you were so excited. You were running, you're telling people you, you couldn't get enough of the word, you couldn't pray enough, you couldn't talk to God enough, and all that stuff. And then about two weeks later, guess who shows up knocking at your door? Satan, but not just that, all of those fleshly desires, all of those passions, all of the things that you're still going to have to deal with in your body. And guess what? They know where you live. They know your address. They even have your email address. They have hacked your accounts. And they know the information. And here's what happens with sin. We think it's going to be easy. And the persistence and the strength of what we need to drive out is there. So listen very carefully. The failure, here's the third thing I want you to think about. The failure to stay at it will either A, keep you from Jesus, or B, it will diminish your joy. You know who the most miserable person in the world is? The most miserable person in the world is somebody who knows to do right and they don't do it. The most miserable person in the world is the Christian who knows the Lord Jesus, and yet they play with sin. Let me tell you something about sin. I've said this before. Sin will take you further than you want it to go. Sin will make you stay there longer than you want it to stay. And sin will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. Mark it down. Now, I know what you're thinking, Pastor. If the command to drive out all of the enemies of God out of our life is still true. And if these enemies are really persistent, I want you to think with me now, and we'll, we'll, we'll apply that in a minute. If, the, if, if these enemies are really persistent, and the failure to drive out our sin either keeps us from Jesus or diminishes our joy in Jesus... What do we do? Well, I'm glad you asked. You asked really good questions. Let me give you four basic things, okay, real quick. Number one, pray. Pray. Now, that may not seem like much, but I'm not talking about God's neat, let's see, amen. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to thank, which is kind of a, that's kind of a really bad thing to pray with your kids, isn't it? Hey, little Johnny, we're going to put you to bed. You might die, and we went whatever, whatever. Here's the kind of prayer I'm praying. You, you drop to your knees, and you say, God, I, I need, I need you. I, I need you, and you alone, and you alone are going to get me through this. That's the kind of desperate heaven-shaking kind of prayer that you have to have to drive out the enemies of your soul. Number two, I want to encourage you to embrace the principles of the Word of God. In other words, prayer is coupled with the Word of God. Brothers and sisters, do you have a Bible in your house Get the dust off your Bible. It'll save your poor soul. You know that old gospel song? Dust on the Bible. 
Dust on God's holy word. Get that dust off your Bible. It'll save your poor soul. I know what you're thinking now, Kevin. Keep your day job. Amen? But I got the point across. Listen. The principles and the precepts of the word of God, that Bible you have on your book or your smartphone or your, or your app you have on your computer, get into the word. The word of God tells us the truth of God, and the truth of God gives us the freedom of God and can help us deal with these enemies of our soul. Let me give you a third principle. Not just prayer and not just the principles of the Word of God. And by the way, do you remember what God said to Joshua in chapter 1? Joshua, while you're going in to drive out these enemies, don't err to the right or the left from the Word. You stick with the Word. Let me give you a third thing. Practice righteousness. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that good deeds can lead to your salvation or your your, uh, sanctification. What I'm saying is, is that when you pray to God for help and you look at his principles for truth, then practice what you pray about and practice what you read. So, for example, the Bible tells us to love our neighbor. Husbands, let me just do this illustrative here. Husbands, the Bible tells you to love your wife. Now, I know if you've been married a long time, you're probably thinking, her? Yeah, her. Well, she knows I love her. Does she really? Love your wife. Not only love God, but love your wife. And guess the way you do this? You practice loving your wife. And what does that mean? It means to build her up to be in Jesus. It means to encourage her heart. It means to pray with her. It means to have joy with her. It means to encourage her. I I, I could go on and on about what it means to love your wife. And you're practicing this. I once heard a Christian counselor say this. This couple came to him. They They were messed up. They'd been married forever. They were at each other's throats. And in this counseling session, the counselors looked at the husband and said, let me ask you a question. If you did love your wife, what would you do? Well, I'd probably buy her flowers and take her out on a date and we'd go see a movie and I may vacuum the floor. Hold a vacuum. That's now we're crossing the line there, amen. I'd help do the dishes and whatever it is. Well, why don't you start doing those things? You come back in 25 days. I want you to do something at least once a day for 25 days for your wife as if you did love her even though you say you don't. 25 days later, came in. He had roses for the counselor. He said, man, what happened? He said, man, 25 days ago, I didn't love, I really didn't love my wife. I lost passion. I went out and got her flowers. Then the next day I did something. And actually, after 25 days, I found out that I was really married to a great gal. Isn't that amazing? So, so think about this. If we're to drive out those things that are an enemy of your soul, it could be an attitude, it could be behavior and you pray about it, and you get into the Word, then just do what it says. This is not rocket science. Well, I don't want to. It doesn't make sense. Sometimes the Word doesn't make sense. But at some point, brothers and sisters, we either believe what we believe or we don't believe it at all. Amen? Let me give you a final thing. Praying's not enough. The word's not enough, and practicing righteousness is not enough. Here's the final thing. You can't unless you have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You cannot drive out the enemies of your soul without the power of God. And let me just encourage you, brothers and sisters, to lay your heart bare before God And say, blessed Holy Spirit, I need your strength and your power. That when those moments of temptation come, when those moments of challenge come for me to drive out the enemies of my life, that I will not be like the tribe of Manasseh who kind of fiddle around. And because these enemies were persistent, they kind of let them hang around. And because they hung around, they were constantly hanging around, and they they constantly were a burr under the saddle. They were a thorn in their side. I want to 
drive these things out. Now let me close with this illustration. I'm almost done. I want you to think very quickly, what is your besetting sin? That's an old-fashioned word, isn't it? You know where I got it from? I got it from the Bible. In Hebrews chapter 12, you know what it says? It says, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, that is, all those people who have gone on before us, let us lay aside every weight and every sin that easily entangles us and let us keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy of the cross endured the shame and now is seated at the right hand of the Father. Let's run with endurance this race. Now I want you to think, what is your besetting sin? You got it? Don't be thinking about your neighbor's besetting sin. That's real easy, isn't it? What is your besetting sin? You know what that is? It's that constant sin. It's just constantly there. And in Hebrews chapter 12, it's pretty interesting. It doesn't say that every sin is a bad thing. It says, let us lay aside every weight and every sin. Did you know that something even that's good can turn into sin if it causes you to stumble? You say, preacher, what do you mean? Let's say that you were an Olympic athlete. I don't think we have in here today, but let's say you were. And you ran the 100-meter dash, which in my, in my next life, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be an Olympic athlete. And just imagine you're Hussein Bolt, the fastest man alive. And you're from the Bahamas, and you get up to the starting line, and instead of wearing the barely no clothes, those skimpy shorts and whatever, to make him lean in the air, make him cut through the air, you walk up there with a winter coat on. And Hussein Bolt says, Hey, Ma, how you like my coat? That's a good coat. I got it on sale at J.C. Penney's. It's awesome. You going to run the race in that? Oh, yeah, it's a good coat. In fact, man, it's, it's 80 degrees here. That's cold from where I'm from. Well, Hussein, you can't, you can't wear a coat like that. Man, it's, well, it's a good coat. There's nothing wrong with a coat, is there? Folks, there's nothing wrong with a coat unless what is good has become a stumbling block. You say, Hussein Bolt, you, you got to take the coat off. So think with me. What is your sin or what is the good thing, the good thing that has wrapped itself around your legs and keeps causing you to stumble? You got it? Everybody got yours? I got mine. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that thing to the Lord and pray over it. Say, God, here's this sin, or here's this good thing that's gotten out of place, and I need you to help me drive it out. And then open your Bible and begin to search the Scriptures about that particular area. And then begin to to live a life without those things. You say, preacher, make it plain. Blackberry cobbler is really good. We are going to eat it in heaven. But if I eat too much of it, I begin to get as wide as I am tall. Can I get a witness on that? Amen. Hey, now, stop. Don't say amen too much. And begin to practice by just pulling away. You see, my hunch is, we got some sin in the room this morning, but my hunch is, we also have a lot of good things that have become the best thing and you wonder why you're stumbling and you're looking for the bad, wicked sin. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't got drunk. I haven't got arrested. I haven't got whatever. What is it? Well, it could be the good thing has taken God's place. 
And after you've prayed about it and put it before the Lord, and after you've looked for the principles and precepts of God, and after you've practiced to get up and say, I, I think I can live without this, or I, I think I'm going to just put this out of my heart and mind, then you ask, God, I need, I, need, I need your power. I am helpless, hopeless, apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. When they didn't drive them out, you know what they thought they would do? There's one telling thing here. Oh, I know what we'll do. It's right there in your text. They made the Canaanites their slaves. In other words, the people of God said, well, I can control this. I can control these Canaanites. I'll make this my slave. Can I tell you this? Anything you keep in your life under the guise that you can control it, you will not enslave it. It will enslave you. Pray this morning. Take all the shackles, Lord. Let's drive out everything that is the enemy of my soul, whether good or bad. I need your help. I lay it before you, and God will give you the victory. And it all begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. The one who liberates, the one who forgives because of what he's done. Jesus returns to his hometown and he says this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. To proclaim to heal the blind, to heal the sick, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he sat down, closed the book, and he said, this is fulfilled in your hearing. Brothers and sisters, the one, the only one who can ultimately drive out the enemies of your soul is none other than Jesus Christ. And I want to know, do you know him? Do you know him? You say, Pastor, I want to know him. I want to know him. How can I know him? Know this, know that he loves you. Know this, know that he died for you and he took all your sin. Know this, that he was buried and he was raised from the dead. Know this, that every person who turns from their sins, he will in no wise cast out. You say, Pastor, I already know him, but I'm having trouble. Submit everything to God and he will give you freedom. Let's pray. Father, we are all susceptible to the enemies of our soul. Whereas Manasseh, this tribe, this one tribe, this one tribe, decided not to put up the constant fight of driving out the enemies that you told them to drive out. And Father, this is true in our lives. The command is still true. The command is still true to drive out anything that would come between us and you. Now, these enemies are persistent, in fact, deadly. But, Father, we thank you for the freedom and the liberty and the forgiveness and the victory that we can have in Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, that today we as believers would be reminded to not play around with sin, but to continue to offer that up to you, to be forgiven, to be given strength. And then, Father, there may be somebody here, one or two or more, that they have yet to trust Christ. They have yet to gain that initial victory. They can't even win the war. So I pray that today they would submit themselves to you as their Lord and Savior. I'm going to ask you to stand, every head bowed, every eye closed, if you would. We're going to give a simple invitation. If you need to talk to somebody to come and pray, you do that. You come and take my hand and say, I want to trust Christ. We have people who will talk with you, pray with you, open the word with you. 
Now I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to sing together. Father, it is sweet to trust in Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that as we hear your voice, as we feel the the compulsion to trust you, there's something happening in somebody's soul here today to trust you by faith. I pray that we would do that and know the sweetness of what it means to trust in Jesus. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Let's sing together. Sing together. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take Him at His word Just to rest upon His promise Just to know the same